and you are listening to WBAI New York. theme song, Mendelssohn's Spinning Song, Opus 67, number four. Great performance, but I didn't choose it. That performance was chosen by our special guest host, Lisa Yui, and what a pleasure it is to have Lisa here with us. Good morning, James. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Let me first identify who Lisa, I mean, we wouldn't just ask anybody in off the street to be a guest host. You know that. (laughs) I hope not, yes. uh, We're careful who we uh, associate with. Uh, Lisa uh, is is most active as a teacher at Manhattan School of Music. She's mm-hmm. a fantastic pianist, has CDs out. Uh, she teaches courses in recorded history of the piano, mm-hmm. which is a great course. She teaches a, a theory course on Beethoven sonatas, uh, analyzing various uh, of right. uh, sonatas mm-hmm. of Beethoven. And uh, you also teach, is it the John Calley School of Music at Montclair State? Is that the name of this music school? I te- yes, I teach a graduate piano literature at Manhattan School of Music as well, and I teach a piano at uh, Montclair State University. Okay. And uh, Lisa has uh, chosen our program for today. Yes. And you've, uh, now I just want to make sure, Lisa, that we're getting you properly over the air. So just give a count. No, you're all right. Just uh, just give a little count. Give me a one, two, three into that mic. One, two, three. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. So Trust you want to sneak up a little more on okay. the mic or bring Very it over, good. Your, slide it over to Very you. Very good. There. Ah, okay. now your full presence. <laughs> your full presence is required and appreciated. So, uh, Lisa, you're a busy lady. And you're I playing. Can. I just heard your concert. I should let the listeners know. Yes. I think I must have told them. And I'm still your... your uh, 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 Mazorksky is still resonating. Thank you, thank you. It was actually a, quite a, an important event for me because I had just undergone back surgery this past summer, and I feel like um, I, I approach music performance in a different way since then. I mean, it's with uh, kind of less stress and more joy and appreciation and gratitude, and I feel that it's completely transformed the way I kind of live my life in music, which is a great thing. I'm still learning. Yeah. Well, I've heard your playing repeatedly, more than a lot more than once. I've l- listened to your CDs, and I think that was the best I've ever heard oh, you play. Oh, thank you. That means a lot for you to say that. Thank you very much. And especially uh, the uh, pictures. It's a great piece. It could be a kind of a, a silly piece, you know, just the programmatic work, you know, imitating chicks dancing around and so forth, but I, I believe it's a deeply psychological work. I mean, uh, Mussorgsky composed it uh, following the death of a close friend, and uh, to treat it like some uh, fun, flashy, you know, simply imitating, you know, programmatic work is the wrong approach, I think. I think it has to be devastating, you know, I think it has to be kind of um, 
you know, psychological is, is the word that I think of. Well, you, you gave it great unity Thank in its you. diversity, yes. which I think is one of the things you may be talking about, and uh, it really worked. Yes. Thank you. Now, <coughs> by the way, your, your choice of Louis Diemé for our uh, mm -hmm. theme song, wonderful. Yes, uh, DMA was uh, born in 1843, which would, <laughs> you know, which would mean that Chopin was living, Schumann was alive, Tchaikovsky was just born, uh, Brahms was just a little child, a preteen, and to hear someone perform from that time, you know, uh, a work by a contemporary, pretty much. I think is really changes the way we hear things. Well, and Mendelssohn was alive. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and so it's it's our equivalent of playing. <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, I've <laughs> any of these uh, the contemporary musicians of today, and it it completely alters the way our understanding i think of the way um we we play these works ourselves yeah it's a, it's a question of, it's not a question of personal uh, uh, knowledge or association it's a question of the culture that you're born into and that's their the culture language. yes yeah. yes absolutely and uh dma was also a great teacher as you know of yves not and uh corto robert casa de Sousse. and he really created a whole generation of, of pianists that we hear today and um, this is something very, very important for me. And uh, to hear recordings of pianists who studied with Liszt, of uh, people who studied with Lechetitsky, you know, people who studied with Czerny and so forth. And um, it's the closest we can get to having a lesson with Liszt or Czerny themselves. And um, I think pianists, uh, especially young pianists, will benefit enormously from listening and not just listening, but deeply studying these works, which are two different things, as you know. Some pian I think piano students tend to begin in the middle of the chain in their studies. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's not anchored, really. You know. Yes, and I'm constantly <coughs> surprised by how little they're aware of, you know, these documents that are, you know, at their fingertips. And especially today on YouTube, with YouTube, I mean, it's so easy to hear these recordings. Uh, when I was younger, you know, um, it was much more difficult. We had to really oh, dig. Yes, of we course, had to dig, definitely. but that was but that was part of the fun as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's always the journey, the adventure that's more fun, and you learn so much in the mm -hmm. process. Research has changed generally uh, across it's all fields. Easier, which is not you know um, necessarily a better thing because we learn so much during the process of the search. And you know, there's, for example, in, in, in well, one of my uh, interests is, is, is uh, a certain area of rabbinic study. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the great scholars of the great age of scholarship, which I would place at the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, mm -hmm. especially the late 19th yes. century, and especially in the German language, yes. uh, these guys knew everything and they didn't have databases nowadays if you want to say well where did i see that uh, that that phrase where is that mm -hmm, show up mm -hmm. you just go to th something called the bar Ilan database you type it in mm -hmm. and you immediately in like a nanosecond I get understand. every single text that has that you know I and understand. that's just and but these other guys knew all that mm -hmm. without the database mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. studied yes and it's like part of them it's you know? part of them because they went through the process and I think of all each of these recordings that we'll be listening to today, and I think of all the people I met in the process, right? So Friedman, for example, I think of our mutual friend, mm -hmm. Alan Evans, and how I was a student when he came to my class and started talking about this, and the conversations I had with him and the other uh, many, many recordings that um, he introduced me to, and the friendship that we've, we've um, gained from this. And so, it's not just about the discovery, but it's the journey, and it becomes a part of you. And it sounds like kind of a, a really cheesy movie, <laughs> but no, but it's, it's really it's real true. Thing. It's it's really it's become part of my life. It's not just the recordings themselves. Absolutely, and 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 there is almost a sacred quality about uh, you know it's kind of a sacred path, a golden path. You know. Yes, um, I don't want to be a museum curator and just simply. Um, listen to recordings of dead people you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm because i'm also an educator and i consider you know i'm a pianist as well and so all these recordings i don't want them to just simply be a curiosity and just you know we geek talk about these things i want them to actually feed into the future musicians and what we create Absolutely. today and you can't 
if you're a pianist, you cannot say people can't play the piano anymore because you're playing the piano. <laughs> you know, and what, although, are you, what are you going to do? You know. <laughs> although they do seem like they were gods back then, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but in, in a way, you're, well, of course they are, and they still are. But yes. uh, but uh, you can't. But they're uh, dead. You, <laughs> you yeah, yeah, you're you're the voice now, and you have Absolutely. to assimilate what they have offered, you know, and, and make it your own. You always have to make it your own, but yes, uh, yes. you can't make yourself out of nothing. Yes, it's absolutely true. It's a it's a whole family tree, and we're not born out of nothing. And so if we look at these pianists and their genealogy, I mean, we can trace them back to, you know, as I was saying, Czerny and Beethoven and on and on, then Mozart and so forth. And it's it's kind of like, oh, we all came from, you know, our own Adam and Eve, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it we're really, it gives us a straight, a very strong sense of um, groundedness and history. And um, this is really, oh, we have wonderful, wonderful great grandparents you know and um these recordings are a wonderful reminder of that absolutely by the way go, getting back to jamie for a second mm -hmm. because it's such a marvelous one first of all maybe we now know where rachmaninoff got his idea of extending the introduction because jamie doesn't play it as written as that's interesting or maybe it was a tradition as well well i'm suspecting it was a tradition and i think that people just wanted that they say it's not really revved up yet absolutely and the all these that's funny um and all these pianists were also composers back then and they didn't really think much of altering a couple of things as long as they spoke the musical language so um, have we have to kind of speak the musical language in order to make it authentic. And this was pre-worshipping the printed page era, you know. We uh, kind of misinterpret uh, the, that term, I think. You know, it's not about, it's not written in stone, it's about speaking the language. Absolutely, you know? and it works. I mean, who's going who's gonna to be shocked by that? Especially <laughs> if you've never heard the piece, you say, well, I like that piece, but why? what was that long <laughs> thing in the beginning? You're not going to think anything like that. Well, some think, oh. well, though, if you play this in a, in a you know, conservatory jury or something maybe they'll <laughs> right. there'll be some you know, i don't know how much people. luck you'd have if you did that in a in a, in a uh, competition setting like a jury or something Absolutely. i mean they may just decide that snarl at you you know maybe. You? well to play a, a song <laughs> without words for a competition also you know it's it's too it's too pretty <laughs> you yeah. know as if pretty is easier in any way the other thing i love about what jamie does we should almost play it again because mm -hmm. it's been it's been a while but we won't okay but <laughs> it is his beautiful use of accents Wonderful, isn't it? I His mean, the choice, you know, where to put them. Yeah. Not always on the strong beat, but often on a high note. And certainly dun, dun, not dun, where it's dun. written all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. It's, there, yeah. I don't know if there are any accents yeah. really held. And I think that's uh, what well, the recordings we're going to hear. We're going to hear a lot of that, and we'll we'll they'll be doing things that are not written on the score. And how do they choose these things? You know, where in the world did they get these ideas? And so for pianists, I think of today, of today, these are wonderful lessons. You know, why pay hundreds of dollars for lessons when <laughs> you can get a lesson from a student of Liszt, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, as yeah. far as where they get th those things, where they come from, I'm a firm believer in, in the, the uh, musician as prophet, mm -hmm. who re simply receives, listens, and does what he what he's uh, was was beamed down to him. Yes, and according, I mean, you read all these the these treatises, right? Performance practice books of the past, and they would list all these rules. You know, the grace note is on the strong beat and trills from the upper note, <laughs> right? But at the end, the really good treatises they'll end with, but according to your good taste, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and so remember taste. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> That's right. Taste is not something you you just study out of a book. It takes years of living with the music absolutely yeah. all right anyway i think we should proceed if Shall we're going to we? be able to play more than three <laughs> pieces this morning right so why don't you tell us what's happening okay so um in my class the historical recordings of great pianists um i like to kind of start from the beginning so to speak and so one of the earliest recordings of of a great famous pianist um comes from 1904 by camille saint-saint by the way the dma was also recorded in 1904 was it yeah. the, in, interesting per, uh maybe it was around you know the summer of 1804 which was the time when saint-saint had it recorded Ni in 1904 in, in, i'm sorry <laughs> we knew it's you not meant that that old yes <laughs> 1904 um but saint-saint during his lifetime around this time he was probably 
one of the most famous composers and pianists of that time, and we kind of forget that because of uh, his fame as a composer. But uh, this is him playing an abridged version of the G minor piano concerto number two. And uh, so no, or no orchestra, but uh, he kind of combines both. Okay, I, I, it's a wonderful recording. I love the way he plays this. So that was Sansons uh, playing the abridged version of his own piano concerto number two in G minor. I mean, amazing. I mean, he was almost 70 at this time. And the next time he recorded, he was almost 85. And uh, just phenomenal technique. And you, you can't call him an old man in any way. I mean, the passion. And the Pianists are like that. I mean, sometimes, not always. <laughs> but one, one person's... Uh, uh, 62 is another person's 92, you know. Maybe so, yeah. And, and you can hear what a virtuoso he must have been, you know, in his prime even, right? But he sounds very much in his prime already. He sounds completely all 100% there. Absolutely. And we were talking about this myth of uh, 
not being able to play in time and this performance you can hear that the rubati are it's so flexible so natural but one would be able to conduct to it absolutely and uh, you hear the passion in his playing you know people think of french pianism and they think of uh, you know surfacey light mm -hmm. clickety clacks there's mm -hmm. a term people use like the tiki tiki tuck school i don't know who <laughs> said that somebody did some french <laughs> scholar of music or some non french probably some german yeah. scholars no these are. schools are completely Un untrue their their myths the french school the the russian school especially of the russian schools being bangy and just only fingers you listen to these great great russian pianists or the soviet pianists and you hear that there is no such thing as a school and there's only good playing and Absolutely. bad playing that's right you know what's a fascinating thing about i always thought about uh, uh, saint sans is that he was taught uh, with the guide main mm -hmm. yes oh my gosh the the torture machines uh, well, although the guide main was not really a, that, as much of a torture as the chiroplast, the logier, which actually you had to put your fingers through rings. Well, there are three parts <laughs> to the chiroplast, right? You had the uh, hand guides and the wrist guides and the, and the what was it, the note guides or something. They're horrendous. There was one that was here that really looks like a, these are little machines to keep your, to, to, to learn technique at the keyboard, basic technique, <laughs> like five finger positions. The worst one I ever saw is called the dactylion. Sure. I think, was that Henri Hertz? Who, oh, uh, sure. I have a, a kind of a, a, a pick an ad actually of the dactylion, <laughs> you know, just up in my, uh, <laughs> hanging up it in the wall. It looks like it's made out of, it looks like it weighs like 80 pounds, it's like heavy yeah. blocks of metal and it's, stuff. It's, you know, know if, if it has kind of a, you know, uh, Latin based name, you know, <laughs> it, it must be, it must be uh, mechanical and but, useful. But the, the guide main that, that, that uh, uh, Saint-Saëns uh, uh, learned through Stamati, who mm -hmm. was through Kalkbrenner, I see. Oh. Kalkbrenner being kind of the, the king of the Je Perle school, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and as an executive, executant, he must have been wonderful because, after all, Chopin raved about him. Absolutely. He didn't rave about his compositions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. he never would have. Yes, yes, yes. But he raved about his playing. And uh, he, Kalkbrenner is the one that uh, was described by a contemporary as polished as a billiard ball. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, thank but, goodness uh, Chopin decided not to study with him. Yeah, and, and as a consolation prize was he got the dedication of the E minor concerto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, consolation. <laughs> but uh, uh, but Saint-Saëns actually thought that it was a good thing that he started with the, I mean, the, the guide main mm -hmm. is much less constricting. It's just a rail. He said, mm -hmm. I discovered it by cutting cutting off the part of one of my armchairs <laughs> that's in the introduction to the guide main. Really? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to, his, his, to his method, to the mm -hmm, Kalkbrenner mm -hmm. method. And, and and you just rest your your wrist on a on a rail, but your fingers are not you know mm -hmm. captured in any you know torture device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said it was a good way to start, but uh, he said it, it's it's it won't teach you everything, and it's mainly for like it would be good for a harpsichordist and stuff. Well, uh, like anything else, I suppose if you use it for a certain part and a certain aspect of of your technique, I mean it could be fine. But if you rely on it completely, I mean that's when the danger arises. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but he had he he had some good good things to say about the uh, about the, hmm. the guide man. But then he also had other bad things to say about it, which we we don't have the time to go into. <laughs> well, when we do our two hour guide man don't, special, we'll don't, uh, don't we have four hours today? <laughs> 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 so, um, it's sounding like it. Um, yeah. All right. What's next? So next is another very very early pianist. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I wanted to interrupt to say one more fact sure. Sure. that it's astonishing hmm. that when Saint-Saëns was born, yes. Chopin still had 14 years to live. I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and, Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's astonishing. Yeah. Time. It, and it, I'm sorry to jump in. Go ahead. No, not at all. Um, so the next uh, on the menu is Vladimir de Pachmann, uh, dubbed the Chopinzi, uh, <laughs> unfairly, I think, uh, playing the so-called Minute Waltz by Chopin. And this one is rather curious because we have commentary by him. And so he's going to, he, he explains what he's going to do, which is to play it kind of normally the way Chopin wrote it, and then rather slowly, and then staccato, uh, very short, a la Paganini, the, the great virtuoso Italian violinist. And um, it's quite wonderful. So let's hear this. I will play waltz D flat major. They call it minuten waltz. Stupid, isn't it? 
Chopin never, never looked at watch when he wrote this one. As of first I begin like it's written down, and afterwards, <coughs> the slower movement, I play a little slower than usual. And afterwards, I play a few bars again, staccato, spiccato, Im imitate Paganini, you see, I always go to the first. You know. And then afterwards I come again a la Chopin, ligato, and finishing like that, you know, aristocratic mode. That applause was given to himself, of course. Didn't right? he, on his second take and the one that was published to at the end, yeah, da 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 da, all I, in the treble? I, I think don't he remember. Does. What, I mean, why not, right? Why, <laughs> why not? not? You know. <laughs> now, well, a wonderful choice, Lisa. That oh, was great. Well, thank you. Um, it's, I, I was really debating whether to choose this one, which is obviously quite funny, and um, and also you get to hear his wonderful sound and the technique he had, but I. Don't, I think he's already been presented as kind of a, a clown, you know, and there's so many stories one could say about him, how he would make a mistake at a, at a, during a concert and he would say, oh, you know, he would slap one of the hands and he said, oh, now he sounds like Paderewski. You know? The, the <laughs> great one is where he's, he's fidgeting at the, at the, on the bench because he can't get comfortable and, and, and he's messing with the height. He's turning the thing, get up and down, and then he takes a... a takes a piece of paper out of his music book and puts it down and then sits down and, ah, oh, that's now it's perfect oh. because of the width of a piece of paper. It made I a see, I see, I see. <laughs> or he would kick someone out in the front row because that person was ugly, oh, right? God, Too the ugly. the woman who looked like a monkey. Oh, my <laughs> God. As if he was such a dashing <laughs> right, man. <right>? Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, this was a man... Oh, so um, I was really... Uh, I was trying to decide whether to choose this one, which kind of shows this zany side of him, or to choose... Um, the E minor nocturne, Opus 72, number one, where he, you don't hear any bar lines, you don't hear any hammer That's sounds. also an electrical recording. Yes. Yeah. And it is surreal almost. It's beautiful. Right? It's very beautiful. And you realize, oh, he was not simply a clown, you know? Well, you can listen to his earlier <laughs> recordings and see that. For example, mm -hmm. he has another recording of this piece from 1907. Yes, 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 absolutely. And uh, he, he still does. He still goes, rises up that chromatic run <laughs> and down, <laughs> even in 1907. Yeah. But it's but it's it's a little more, you know, elegant and, you know, straightforward in mm -hmm. a way. But still, he's, uh, you, he's in the spirit, you know. It's the same spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, he studied with Dax, who was a pupil of Czerny, and um, he studied counterpoint with Bruckner. He met Liszt. I mean, this is kind of a different world, and this is a person who 
truly spoke the language of Chopin. He lived the, the, the world of Chopin. And to not um, make use of this wonderful treasure we have of, of his recordings, it would be um, kind of stupid. And he's another one of these pianists <coughs> who um, withdrew from the public eye mm -hmm. for years so he could, re like Liszt did, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he could uh, work very hard on his playing and get it all right. Yes, and that's kind of an aspect that we don't really know about him as much and i think it's because the 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 silly side of him or the crazy side of him is is so much more interesting in a way you know and the other side of this actual pianist this artist actually having to work is uh kind of boring for us you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's too normal for us yeah <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful <coughs> recording. I, I I almost want. There's one part of the introduction. Like, can mm -hmm. we re replay his Why just not? his uh, his in, his spoken show. introduction? Why not? Yes. Otherwise, I'm going to cut your mic. <laughs> I just want to uh, wait. For, uh, just just the just the talking. There's one part there that we can't really translate. Right? He says mm -hmm. one thing. Uh, go ahead. Let's hear it. I will play waltz. D flat major. They called me Newton was stupid, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Chopin never, never looked the watch when he wrote this one. As of first, I begin like it's written down, and after that, <coughs> the <laughs> slower movement I play a little slower than usual. And after that, I play a few bars again, staccato, spiccato, Im imitate Paganini. You see, I always go to the first. You know. That's the one. See, I won't go out to the fair. <laughs> what is he saying? Yeah, I, I think know. you should ask your listeners, you know. If anybody there yeah. knows what, <laughs> I won't go out to the fair. <laughs> I won't go to the fair because I hate the rides. And the freak show freaks me out. He's his, you know, his number one fan, you know, how he just kind of laughs at his own jokes. Yeah, that's somewhere. right. Yeah. And the, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, the clapping may or may not have been him because he had a kind of an, a relationship with his engineers I too you know, so, but, but why I would they have a mic i could totally see himself clapping yeah, for himself though, <laughs> <Of course. yeah. laughs> but it's like right it's 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 like right close up on the mic as yes. if he like leaned into the lid <laughs> to to lead the audience into applause right <laughs> Greatly so. Okay, let's go. Okay. What's up? So next is Alfred Grunfeld. Oh, I forgot one thing oh, to say. You did that before. I, you know, so I think yes. I'm going to keep doing it. No, it's just a short <laughs> thing, and that is that the fun that he has, he's not unprecedented in what he does with that because uh -huh. uh, 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 there's a wonderful collection of CDs of the, of the block yes, cylinders. Yes, absolutely. And yes. you listen mm -hmm. to Paul, Paul Popst playing the Mazurka, Opus mm -hmm. 33, number two, mm -hmm. and he makes a, he makes a, a riot of fun party riot at uh -huh. this that is peace you know i mean it there's you think well he doesn't have respect a lot of people would mm -hmm. think that he has no respect for the music you know that's they didn't really learn how to play yet uh -huh. but they were enjoying themselves it was Absolutely. music you know Absolutely. it was pleasure and there was um, an aspect of childishness that he maintained and um a kind of a purity you know of of the heart and uh, innocence of heart yeah, yes right. and yeah. and that accompanied with um hard work is really quite powerful yeah that, that's that's good that's a good a good observation to have that innocence and at the same time be a be a mensch at, mm -hmm. uh, at working you know mm -hmm. okay i'm so sorry I keep no 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 you. no no um so the next is uh, alfred grunfeld who was uh born in prague and prague Pra prague yeah, that's right <laughs> um he was court pianist of um, emperor wilhelm first you know of, of germany not too which shabby is not too shabby it's very glamorous i think and um, here he is playing his own transcription of uh, Strauss Jr.'s Soirée de Vienne, who actually he, he knew personally as well. And so this is a man who also lived the life of the, the Viennese waltz. And um, I, I think the Viennese waltz is something that is very difficult to, to recreate in today's performances because it's a world of chivalry. It's a world where the gentlemen, there are ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen, you know, the ladies are, are weak flowers, you know, they're beautiful, weak flowers, and, uh, and this kind of sense of romance that is in the Viennese waltz is something that is a little foreign in today's very, uh, you know, PC um, feminist times, but as performers, we have to kind of see the beauty of this and live, go back in time and understand this, and I think this performance um, 
is a wonderful way of, of understanding this world. That kind of that kind of ability kind of separates the adults from the children in terms of being interpreters, you know, to oh, be able absolutely. to absorb a culture not your own. Ab and you would think that the younger performers would have more of that, but it's not always the case. Sadly. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, the <laughs> youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's hear okay. it. Thank you. 
Holy dogfish. That's right? great playing. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, so you were saying that this was recorded in 1910? Yes. And, I mean, to be able to... I mean, what psychologically what it means to be able to play something like this before the two world wars and the Vietnam War and just to not have a sense of irony, you know, is kind of a, a interesting thing to think about. But um, life was life was easy, as Schoenberg wrote at the beginning of his Opus 42 oh. piano concerto, when oh. the that lilting kind of and in his manuscript he wrote life was easy <laughs> well I don't know if it was easy but, <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> but it certainly was is, a different different world I mean he wrote the thing in 1942 so uh-huh, he knew uh-huh. that something was coming up and a dark, the sky darkens very mm-hmm. quickly in that piece mm-hmm. but uh, yeah this plan and that you know we were talking while we were listening to it about the, the tone that comes through in that 1910 recording Amazing, isn't it? Acoustic, I mean, playing into a yes. horn. You know? And it's in, it's strange how today technology is it's so improved and so forth, but people settle for worse sound qualities. You know, MP3, I will. it's getting worse. Absolutely. I find that I own a CD of something and I choose to listen to it on YouTube, <laughs> which is horrible. I don't care. Yeah. As long as um, I can hear the music. I mean, it's nice to hear great transfers right. and everything. But, right. But, you know, uh, uh, I don't care. Uh-huh. I just want to hear the mu- If the music comes through, I'm happy. Sure, but I do remember listening to... Um, the first time I heard Richter's Pictures on Exhibition, the famous recording from Sophia. Yeah. Uh-huh. I heard that on an LP. That's Is where it? he does Fait Follet as well, right? That's oh, yes, and the and the um, <laughs> Almanie de Soir. Yes, He's the only just... one who gets through that hideous, difficult passage oh in Fait Follet without stopping, without getting slower, and every note you can it, hear. The only one. There was, there was magic that night, certainly. Mm-hmm. But I heard that recording on an LP um, in the libraries of, uh, in the U- University of Toronto Library. And I remember that moment. It was one of these aha moments. It just blew me away. And I was alone in that record booth, and my life had changed. And many years later, uh, the CD came out. And I ordered it, and I was so excited. I heard the CD, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is it's not the same. And I thought maybe I had changed, and um, I was a little sad. Oh, the passage of time and so forth. And then several years later, I returned to the University of Toronto, listened to the LP, and it was still great. Mm. And so sound quality does make a difference, I think, to well, some and, extent. Well, and also it's a, it's a difference between uh, uh, non-digital, which is basically sampling, you Absolutely. know, and uh, the linear, uh, uninterrupted flow of, mm-hmm. a, of, of a, an LP recording. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, I told you I had some surprises I was going to spring yes. on you. Yes, spring, spring away. And even though it's fall, I'm going to spring them on you. <laughs> You're so clever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I stayed up all night figuring that. I wrote it. Okay. Six different versions. That was the final version. <laughs> so I have. I just want to show you something. Okay. Okay. Here we have. And now you can open this. You okay. know, you don't want to paw it like an like an animal. Okay. But you can look <laughs> that at I it. I am. Yes. And you tell me what it says. What it is. Oh, Etude à la Tarantella, by Alfred Grunfeld, autographed manuscript. Oh my goodness. This is in pencil. It's where, a working manuscript. Yeah. Where did you find this? Get this? I found it from my. Uh, uh, oh. Actually, Gregor Benko sold it to me. Wow! It's and an he said to me, "Why do you want this?" Why do and you I want thought, this? "What are you kidding me?" Oh my goodness! <laughs> Look at these these G clefs. They're so beautiful. I mean, this is hardly any changes, right? I no, mean, there's a little insert there. You'll see. There's a kind of a note that yeah. a, stick this in between I, that and that. I you see know. tiny bit erased. Yeah, and, but basically, but he had it in his in his um, head. Yeah. In his I mean, head. I don't know if that was his first. I mean, he obviously did not begin composing the piece sure, on sure. these pages. But this is amazing. This is amazing. I wish you could maybe show a scan of it or something on your Facebook page. Look at this. And he, sign, and he dates it and signs oh it there. Oh, my goodness. What is it, 1895 or something like that? 1897. 1897, yeah. 1897. And, you wow. know, if you read about Grunfeld in the huh. Great Pianist book, the thing that he points out about Grunfeld's playing is that he was an expert at repeating notes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And he Which we heard to, in this performance yeah, as well. Yeah, but as you look at that piece, you can see that it's <laughs> all repeating notes. Certainly. I mean, that's the idea behind that etude. It's an etude in repeating notes. Um, I wonder what kind of piano... He owned. I don't know, but he made a 1905 recording of this piece. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and it's an example of his own salon style and his long suit, which is really repeating notes until, you know. A lot of repeating notes, you're right. And you know what? It's short. I want to play his recording of this oh, piece. please, please. Which is the Etude à la Tarantella, and he, he was known for his repeating notes. That's one of the little, uh, his tricks, you know, that he would uh, bring out of his, his pocket at, at concerts. It's his own salon style, his own music, his own original music. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at his autograph manuscript right now, right here in the studio. So let's listen to it. What do you think? Good idea? Excellent idea. <laughs> okay. I'm going to keep it for right now. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to start it up in the hope that uh, everything works the way it should. Is it the first one is Grunfeld, right? On there? I think it is. Well, let's try. How bad could it be? What could happen? <laughs> is the studio going to blow up? No. We're safe. We're all safe. Okay. Let's see. Hope for the best. Fingers crossed. Alfred Grunfeld in 1905, and, and Lisa was wow. following through the autograph manuscript. Uh, barely, as, barely. As it, <laughs> <laughs> the notes are flying by, right? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, it's an awfully fast tempo for a Tarantella, and, and then, you know, while this person has been bitten by a Tarantella and trying to kind of get rid of the poison in the middle, there's this, like, yes. big romantic, it's like the final That's romantic. the crowd, or, you know, wishing him, wishing him a, a, speedy, a, a speedy get well, you know, and worried about him, fretting over him. So, um, Amazing, thank you for that. And I, you know what, I also have to, I've noticed, uh, as I was uh, observing you with the manuscript, mm -hmm. you know, it is written on 19th century paper, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. the date is signed yes. 1897, and it would be in better shape if it were like 18th century paper or mm -hmm. even 17th century paper, because oh. 19th century paper is like crumbly. It, it's not rag paper. It's, oh. uh, you know, any, any, any printed uh, book or manuscript from, you know, uh, the 18th or century is going to be in better shape than something from 1897. And mm -hmm. uh, I was impressed because you can see it's kind of, ch you see it's, sure. it's been chipped and oh, there's, but like, it's there's in tape, really you know. Oh, really 
good condition. But I was impressed with the way you handled it. Oh, really? I've and I didn't even have to warn you. Oh, I did. I said, don't paw it like oh, an animal, didn't I? I? <laughs> <laughs> that, that scared me. So I was worried. Yeah. <laughs> but some people have no concept of how to handle these things. Well, come on. I've done research with 19th century things at the library, and, you know, these are things that could crumble under your fingers. Yeah, well, that's that's why I handed it to you so oh, quickly, because I, not, I've handed things to other people. That's the nicest thing anyone said to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, it's true. I've handed books, you know, uh, of similar vintage to people, and, and they handed it back to me with broken bindings, yeah. you know, oh and God. broken spines, oh you know, goodness, and things so like horrible. that. That's so so I appreciate that, well, that, you're, you uh, um, that. <laughs> that you, you, you handled the, the original manuscript so well. Well, that's amazing. So there's Alfred Grunfeld and his repeated notes and his, uh, <laughs> as Harold Schomburg said, his, uh, what did he call his, uh, I just told you, is it, he called it his, uh, not not his repeated notes, but his, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I, hmm. I sh if I had been paying better attention, I should be able to. That's all right. You're lost in thoughts. You're That's an artist. Right. <laughs> stuttering. He called it stuttering. Oh, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so Grunfeld went along st his, with his stuttering ways, giving concerts, and Schoenberg, That's or horrible. something like that. Uh -huh. But it's amusing. Okay, we're ready. Okay. Give us more. So, um, well, the pupils of Franz Liszt uh, record left a good deal of, of recordings, but probably the most successful recordings um, left by Lif Liszt pupil was Emil von Zauer. Mm. And um, he was already a polished artist when he went to study with Liszt, and uh, he never really enthusiastically acknowledged the influence of Liszt in his playing, probably because there were so many um, kind of idiots you know, surrounding Liszt and taking advantage of his kindness and generosity, and Zauer didn't really want to be placed among those fools. I can remember a moment, uh, speaking of this, that, 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 that Von Bülow uh, yes. did once, and then when he was one People of the first of generation, course. and he's yeah. the one when Liszt wasn't there, so uh -huh. Bülow was taking over, and he chased all of these people out of the room, and go, get out, <laughs> never come back. You know? It's like Christ, <laughs> right? Fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right, cleaning the, cleansing the temple. Of course, they all came, Liszt let them all come back, yes, you know, yes, after yes. You know, he came back, but... Uh -huh. uh, but it, that's true. Van Zauer credited Nikolai Rubinstein for his real As teaching. As his major teacher, yeah. yes. Especially, you know, when he was younger and probably the most influential age. Um, but Nicholas Rubinstein was extremely, I mean, he was a very hard teacher. And you can, you know, the discipline you hear certainly in Von Zauer's playing. And I think we have this image of Liszt pupils being kind of wild and passionate and uncontrollable. But von Zauer is completely the opposite of that. But not cold, not cold. Oh, um, never. No, and the his recording of La Ricondanza, of the uh, Ninth Transcendental Etude, is one of the greatest of, of that etude, and perhaps, you know, I would even say one of the greatest recordings of, of a Liszt piece ever made. But the one that I would like to play is the tran Liszt's transcription of Mendelssohn's um, On Wings of Song. And that's a great choice. <gasps> Why do you say that? I say it because it's so it's so it's just so beautiful. Oh, the sounds the he sounds, makes and it's all right? balanced. I love his balance between the voices, how that tenor voice comes out, and then yes. when it starts to have a accompaniment added in the treble, mm -hmm. he keeps everything. I mean, you your ear gets mm -hmm. to it, but everything is kept in perfect balance. I mean, I just and think I it's think a the great sound, recording. The sound is the big thing. I mean, today's musicians. I, I don't want to generalize, of course, because there are many, many wonderful pianists active today. But all of the pianists that I, I wanted to play in, in your program today, you recognize them from their sound. And it's almost like their their voice, right? Oh, yeah. And um, there's no way we wouldn't recognize a Corto or a Friedman. Or a you Hoffman. Would know, or a Hoffman, of course, which we'll hear later on. And um, it's it's a very distinct stamp of their of their voice, and uh, I think that's something that we don't spend too much time, you know, studying today. We think about technique, we think about structure, form, but sound quality is something that is absolutely essential. You know, we could you could dislike I've disliked someone because I just don't like their voice. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but I have to mention this, and that is in your uh, something you asked your students to mm -hmm. do, which relates is, is connected with what you're saying in terms of overall sound. That uh, in your class, 
you in your history of recording class, you asked your students to, did, did you select the piece you wanted them to imitate or did they choose one, that, something that oh, they wanted? Oh, so the final project is something that uh, may be considered controversial. Maybe I'm exaggerating the, the importance of it, but um, I give them a list of, of what I consider to be great, great recordings of um, by historical pianists. And only because they are great, and I think you can you know, learn a lot from them, and they're also very short. They're under three minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, the example that I learned from is the Songs Without Words of Friedmont, that which I'd like to play later on. But um, yes, the, they're supposed to write an essay describing what they hear, right? The structure, direction, sound quality, balance, and so forth. And then they have to provide a copy of the score onto which they write every they they kind of mark everything they hear. It could be an arrow showing you know moving forward or retardando or an, a note they add or they omit or they roll and so forth. And I've had a class a, a, a student who actually um, drew a hand with a butterfly escaping from it. You <laughs> I know? Love that. And I thought that was very <laughs> yeah, it was really quite wonderful. Very right? eloquent. Yes, and so um, and the purpose is to not sim. Oh, and the third part of it is to play what they hear. And this could be a really silly project, right? It could be really mechanical and robotic and, you know, just fake, really. But the goal is to really understand the purpose of the choices that these pianists made, of why do they choose to bring out this inner voice? Why do they choose to suddenly play softer when the composer actually put mezzo forte or something? It could be because they're preparing for a crescendo to move forward to this climax later on um, but the goal is to understand the the purpose of the pianist and to integrate it and to see if you can recreate it and in doing that I've learned myself you know so much from this experience and three minutes seems like a short um, a short exercise but it takes a long long time because these the greater the pianist there's more in these uh, in each minute as, as you absolutely. know absolutely yeah. As we're gonna, as we're gonna hear uh, mm -hmm. in another piece that I won't mention. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's listen to uh, okay. Emil von Zauer. What a gorgeous, gorgeous recording. So uh, this is the Mendelssohn List on Wings of Song.
So that was Emil von Sauer playing On Wings of Song by Mendelssohn Liszt. Beautiful sound. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly not a, not a banger, not a only fingers guy. And still in the acoustic. Um, I mean, that was a 1923 recording. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, anything before 1925 and even the first month of 1925 or so mm -hmm. are, are acoustic, acoustic recordings. Yeah. And... Uh, that's a, a beautiful sounding recording. Mm. It's so controlled, you know, but so expressive. And, he, you know, and it, he, he knew what he was doing every beat. Mm -hmm. He may have been inspired, and of course he was, and he may have not always have done things the same exactly, but you could tell that he, he knew, he, he, he mapped it out mm -hmm. and knew what he was doing and made it just sound spontaneous and beautiful. And uh, regardless of what he thought of his Liszt's influence in his playing, he really did respect Liszt very deeply. And he wrote, uh, he described the way Liszt played La Campanella and mm, how the Campanellas yeah. today or of his time are always aiming to break speed records and how he, how Liszt actually played it with such refinement. Mm -hmm. And I think this refinement we certainly hear in von Zauer's own playing as well. He said, they sh you should have heard how Liszt played La Campanella. Mm. You did know? He said it with yeah. that voice? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did. Harold yes. Schoenberg told me that's <laughs> yes. what it sounded like. And it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> yes. All right. We're coming to one of our favorite recordings. All right, well, wh what's next? Maybe I have Actually, my wrong well, order with my list now. <laughs> it's, it's up to you, but I, I was thinking of kind of show, playing two recordings Great. of the same Chopin mazurka because I, Great. I I believe this is I, I do this very often in in my classes and this comes of course from you know many people have done this before my own you know huge influence mentor David Duball does this very frequently mm -hmm. and how if you play one recording if you listen to one version you hear it uh, or but when you play two, as soon as there is something to compare it with, you, it, it's like colors, right? You look at one color, but as soon as you have something to put it against, they seem different or it becomes more vivid in many ways. And so um, I'd like to play one recording of, two recordings actually, of the 15th Mazurka by Chopin. This is the C major, Opus 24, number two. Very, very short, very small, very um, easy in a way. But bold in its way. Bold in a way, well, you know, it depends on how you play it. And so the first version is by uh, the only living <laughs> pianist for today, Emmanuel <laughs> Axe, the, the, the wonderful, great uh, Emmanuel Axe. And so let's, let's listen to this first, and then maybe um, we can talk a little bit about it, and then play another performance by Horshovsky. Thank you. 
Okay, that's the big. That was the beginning of the, the pianist we're going to play next. I was I wasn't sure if you wanted them back to back like that, but I guess you don't. Um, well, I mean, I, I just kind of wanted to mention that it's it's a really fine performance and very. Uh, the ideas are extremely clear, and you know, so this is an example of seeing kind of one color and kind of uh, not having another color against it. So. Um, shall we listen to the Horshovsky? Well, we've already heard like three seconds of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you start three seconds in. <laughs> okay. So that was uh, Horshovsky, um, the second version of our 15th Chopin Mazurka in C major, and um, slower than slower. the first version. But it's not just the tempo, but there is a childlike quality to it, right? Which is interesting considering, do you know how old he was when he recorded this? Probably over 80. Oh, my 90, goodness, yes. Almost 96. 96. 96, right? Just getting into his own. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He's, he's, I think he's maturing gradually. But um, the how I find it fascinating how right before the second half, there's that drone concluding the first half. And he doesn't even count the number of notes he completely deviates and it is very off rhythm it's I mean, a very tied strange from the last part of the measure to the absolutely next part, you know. and if you play it straight it sounds actually really strange but what he creates is an echo effect mm -hmm. it's an echo effect and i think that's absolutely what it is and um the second half we have the bump 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 da -dee -dee, and you can hear this village orchestra playing and Actually, the, how I was introduced to this recording was when I was judging the Canadian Chopin competition two years ago in, up in Mississauga, Canada. And the Polish community, they were just so wonderful and they were driving me here and back and you know from my practice room to the concert place. And this was a week long. And so one person, uh, a gentleman, was kind of the designated driver for me. And he used that opportunity of, you know, 20, 40 minutes every day to play his favorite recordings for me, right? Because he really wanted to talk about these recordings. And he played this Horshowski recording and he was saying, you know, listen to how this middle section is like a village ensemble and they're kind of drunk, bum, bum, bum. And then this other group of instrumentalists, da da dum, bum, ba da dum. And they're a little behind sometimes, right? <laughs> and so there's this very natural quality, but I was so amazed that this is a really subtle performance and this is a s very subtle mazurka. And the deep 
passion and love that this person had for this recording i mean really kind of that's caught on that's to me nice. yeah that's very yeah. nice to hear that's yeah nice. it was really and so i think you hear how a two-minute piece could be a completely different uh thing and he makes so much of it because he, he first of all he never does a repeat the same way mm -hmm. he'll change the dynamic make it usually softer in the mm -hmm. repeat you mm -hmm. know and uh, when the when the th melody changes, mm -hmm. if it's a different section, he gives it a completely different character. The sweetness of that second theme, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But at the same time, it doesn't really sound like a gimmick that he's trying to do something. Oh no, different. it sounds natural as all heck. I, absolutely, it's like a child singing a, a nursery tune or something. And uh, uh, another thing he does, which mm -hmm. is on the more technical side, I suppose, is he makes more of, of the alto voice in the right hand, mm -hmm. mm. you know, of the lower voice, because mm -hmm. the right hand is ha the top notes are mainly like repeated notes mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you know but then the, the moving part is really uh, with the lower fingers yes yes know. yes and uh, uh acts uh, just really kind of tones down that whole thing in the right hand mm -hmm. and brings out that melody that beautiful mm -hmm. melody while the right hand is having repeated notes on the mm -hmm. pinky yes fifth finger as we as oh. we musicians call it <laughs> And but the moving part is in the alto voice, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, Horshavsky makes much more of of, of that uh, as a part, as an orchestral part. And the and the top, the melody itself is a little more subdued, and so it kind of gives this um, complaining, you mm. know, feeling. Here's yeah. another thing Horshavsky does. Mm -hmm. He omits uh -huh. the grace notes. Yes. Yes, and the ba yes. ba -rum, da da dum. Yeah. He just goes da 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 dum. Yeah, yeah. He just emits them. He kind of, yeah, and as the word implies, I mean, he gets rid of the the gracefulness of that section. He kind of makes it a little kind of rustic and it rough. It makes it right? much more villageoise. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as like your friend in the car was saying, uh -huh. that contributes to it. You know, yes. uh, it was more like bum 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 da da dum bum da da dum bum. And the second one comes in a little late, actually. Da da dum bum ba da dum bum ba da dum. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Were we dancing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Yeah, Wonderful but, the, stuff. you know, it's a deceptively, like you say, childlike performance, but there's a lot that goes into that. You, you have know? to turn I mean, 96. He's 96 years old. Play it that childlike You know what would be yeah. fascinating? To hear an early recording of mm -hmm. this mazurka and mm. to hear how he, how he, you know, how he saw it, mm -hmm. uh, how he conceived it, uh, you know, when he was, you know, he was never 76. a big virtuoso, <laughs> but he had chops, you know, when he was younger. Well, certainly. he was Les Chetisky's student. Absolutely, so, you know, yeah. absolutely. Can't, One of the greatest can't do that teachers. Super yeah. chops. Speaking of which, Les Chetisky. Speaking of which. Uh, which leads in beautifully to our next uh, pianist, our one of our favorites, uh, Ignaz mm -hmm. Friedman, who was one of the greatest pupils, I would say. Do you agree? Of the many oh, pupils. Oh, he's, yeah, he's in of the. Of Les He's in the. Um, the Trimurti, you know, <laughs> as they say in India. And there were many great pianists during his time, right? I mm -hmm. mean, Rosenthal, Godofsky, Hoffman, Levine, right? So um, this uh, is actually, I, I had a difficult time trying to choose a recording of Friedman. Um, probably the most famous would be his collection of Songs Without Words of Mendelssohn and With the Mazurkas, Mazurkas for and sure. the Mazurkas, yeah. certainly. Mm -hmm. But I chose this one, the uh, Songs Without Words, Opus 38, number two. Great choice. Do you like it? Yeah. Uh, it's very short, but this is rather close to my heart because it was the first piece that I chose to imitate really, really closely. And I, it's only, it's barely two and a half minutes. And I was shocked by how much time it took for me to really integrate everything he did because you look at the the balance of the sound, Some sound really in itself. Stuff oh, in there. My oh my goodness! Lord. Yeah, really. Where stuff. he slows down slightly, and to kind of understand why he does this, um, I learned so much from trying to um, imitate two and a half minutes of, of this great, great recording. And imitate, you know, I mean, I learned a lot, not just about this piece, about, but about sound production, about balance. And um, I recommend it. <laughs> you know, I, rec <laughs> I recommend it to everyone. So shall we hear this? Yeah, we mm -hmm. may have to play parts of this after we sure. play it, after we talk about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But for now, we'll, uh, we'll let our listeners uh, put on their listening ears. Okay.
So, uh, Ignaz Friedman performing Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words, Opus 38, number two. Great performance. What, oh Fabulous. my goodness, what a master. The tone, the range, the colors, you know. And how, you know, certain notes is is an end of a phrase. It's also the beginning of a phrase and how he times that and how he chooses the sound quality of that. It's Again, thought out. You know, oh, certainly, certainly. Planned. Absolutely. To make take the best advantage. You can't you can't play a piece without really studying it. And clearly, he studied every aspect of that piece. Until it sounds absolutely natural. I wanted, uh, Lisa, to, to illustrate one of the things I love mo most and notice most about this piece that I've already mentioned to mm -hmm. you. And it's close to the beginning. So, mm -hmm. And that is, when he starts the piece, he makes a lot of the melody, of course. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful melody. And every part is there, but we don't, our ear does not go to the bass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's there, and it, ha it contributes its, its effect to mm -hmm. the harmonic uh, fulfillment, you know, mm -hmm, the harmonic mm -hmm. support. But then in the repeat, four notes in the bass go, and with those four notes, the volume increases, mm -hmm. and suddenly our ear is led to the, the bass line on the repeat. Mm -hmm. And that's when we hear the bass as an independent uh, mm -hmm. uh, part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, 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 just, I, just, I just want to hope we can, we can just play that bit of it. To sure. Hear, uh, and also, I mean, might as well, if we're listening to that again. Or the whole also, thing. I mean, I can handle that. Uh, I can handle that, too. Um, the inner voice, how it's obviously, I mean, there's such clear foreground and background. But the background is not any less important. The The inner voice that just goes tss, 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 is mm -hmm. very soft, very soft. You hardly hear it, and probably most people would barely notice it, but it is as steady as a rock, while the right hand is um, seemingly totally free. So that's, that's, what, that's what we call r an ideal rubato. Another mm -hmm. thing about it uh, is... Uh, Friedman has a way of doing what I call a negative crescendo. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, where the, a crescendo is indicated, he'll actually do a diminuendo yes, yes, to yes. the end of the phrase, to uh -huh. the high point of the yes. phrase. You know, which can be really frustrating when it's done badly, and uh, <laughs> when it sounds like a device. You know, right? Absolutely. But I mean, he certainly has no problems with that. But but see if uh, see if the the friends okay. at home <laughs> can he hear what we're talking about and and you know follow that bass line follow the bass <laughs> from those <laughs> dee, da, 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 and then yeah. suddenly there's the bass part
Still good. <laughs> still good. Still Even good. the second time. That's right. It didn't, you didn't get tired of it. After nope. Two times. nope. <laughs> okay, Lisa. Lisa Yui, I should mention who you are. You're, you're our special, special <laughs> guest host. Uh, everybody can hear that you're, 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 uh, you're doing, uh, doing a, wonderful, a wonderful thing for us here. Mm, Lisa you. teaches at the Manhattan School of Music and at the um, uh, Montclair, uh, Montclair mm -hmm. State College. University. University, University excuse me. Yes. <laughs> and uh, teaches classes in the uh, history of the piano recorded in piano lit. Yes. And... Theory and the and Beethoven sonata theory. Right. Theory as as seen in the Beethoven sonatas. That's right. Theory. There is theory in there. Yes. And a, a fine pianist. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's so much fun. We're having fun. I don't know about them, but we're having fun. <laughs> yes, we are certainly. Um, so next is a complete, uh, let's say, dessert, right? A little. Yeah, dessert. definitely. Um, this is Jacques Fevrier, born 1900. And uh, Jacques Fevrier was a pupil of Marguerite Long, one of the big uh, doyen of, of the Paris Conservatory. And he specialized in the music of, of Les Six, right? Uh, Poulenc, and uh, with whom he was uh, childhood friends. Their ages were, I think they were one year apart. And he knew Ravel. Um, he gave the first French premiere of the Left, left Hand Concerto. And um, he accompanied actually Marguerite Long when she was working on the G major concerto and Ravel was behind him and kind oh of instructing you know them what to do and so that's kind of uh, exciting right and so in this performance I wanted to uh, there's a wonderful wonderful recording of him performing Poulenc's concerto for two pianos. It's actually a video that you can watch. There is there is and for many years this was absolutely very very difficult to find this video and i think i you know a friend of a friend of a friend gave me a copy of this but now it's boom it's on youtube and you'd expect everyone to be watching this of course you it's know, a hoot to watch it's because it's such a lively it? piece with for it the hands it really you know? is it really is and uh, so in both performances uh, the the video and this recording he's playing with the composer Poulenc himself and this first movement is so delicious there is you can hear the influence of the Balinese gamelan. You can hear the influence of the, the G major Ravel concerto as well. Um, jazz. Music hall. Uh, music hall, music. vaudeville. You know yes, what I love uh -huh. about Poulenc, just to mention it before mm -hmm. we play it, is that uh, he, he mixes drama and, and high fun. Yes, yes. Very you right know, next close to each other, together. Right? You Absolutely. Know? And you see that in other pieces. I mean, this piece was written in uh, 1932. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Six years later, he wrote the Concerto for Organ, Strings, and Timpani, and that has the same qualities. You know, it starts out with this big drama, mm -hmm. and then the next thing you know, you know, da 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 it's almost kind of a, a mock drama after a while because you take yeah. it seriously. Ooh, what's that? Oh, and then it just changes. It's like a Fellini movie or something. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like and it keeps the. It, it's made to entertain. This yes. music is just, there's no two ways. This is to entertain the oh. listener. Well, my, my theory is if everyone listened to Poulenc and maybe Weber once a day, the world would be a happier place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think so. So shall we do this? Then? Yeah, let's. <laughs>
Isn't that delicious? Great stuff. Oh, God. What a nice, or oh, a waker-upper. Yeah. What a distinctive composer we were observing. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's one of those composers that you, you, you hear, you know, 15 seconds and you know it's Poulenc. Absolutely. Um, I forgot to mention the uh, conductor, which was Georges Prêtre, uh, conducting the or- Orchestre de la Société des Concerts du Conservatoire. So beautifully pronounced. I, it Lisa, was a hard work. It was hard you work. should be on the yeah. radio. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Jacques Février with uh, François Poulenc. Yeah, that's wonderful a that's a stuff. wonderful piece, Isn't you know. And, and the performance, this is the best I've I know of. You know. Very lively, very precise, yeah. and uh, full of full of feeling, mm-hmm. and uh, it 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 gets your attention, doesn't it? I mean, y- y- nobody's going to fall asleep in the audience. You know, no. you're not going to have anybody saying like my original thought. If that guy doesn't stop snoring, he's going to wake up the whole audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, fun is given bad rep today. You know, if it do- if it's not serious, you know, it's the time where the the complete late bronze, you know, that kind of time. But there's so many things mixed together, like we were observing before mm-hmm. in this piece. You know, there's that touching flute melody with that oh, lush uh, harmonies underneath the it, you know. The ending is so beautiful. And it's like the ending of, um, uh, we were talking about the concerto for organ strings, and mm-hmm. that has a similar kind of ending, you know. Yes. With the da, 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 kind of a dream da, state. Da, da, da. Yeah. I mm-hmm. always saw that part, I envisioned it cin- cinematically, as the camera is going underwater, mm-hmm. and it's zooming in slowly on something, that's and you see a woman's hair. Uh-huh. She's in a car that's underwater, and the hair is waving in the gentle uh-huh. current as this thing. It's Can you hear it? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> see I, I see I mean? the hair. I see the hair. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was also thinking, my goodness, this is so cinematic. You know, yeah. It's, it's French film. Did he write French any film. film music? I think so. Because the I French did a lot of that. I know? feel yeah. like I should, and I, I, I'm tempted to say, of course, definitely, but I can't name you a specific film. I'll do my research. Get back to me on that. That's absolutely. And I'll pass it along to the friends at home. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have more French uh, pianists, the same um, generation. Jeanne-Marie Dallet, a lady, uh, born in 1905. And she studied also with Marguerite Long and Isidore Philippe, the other you know, great French we've, teacher. We've spent time with Isidore. Oh, There's no my doubt goodness, about I'm that. Sure, I'm sure you have. And Dallet was... Uh, there are actually videos of her performing, and it's it's quite amazing because she was quite old. Um, no, I shouldn't say that. She was older <laughs> in these she films. She was of a certain age. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But she is a Parisian. You know, her hair is perfectly in place. She's wearing pearls. And what's so funny is that her nails are painted. You know, I've never, and they're long and they're painted. Parisian ladies are Parisian ladies to the end. Absolutely. You know, you look at videos of Monique La Bruchellerie, you know, and, and people like Gorgeous. this. You know, they're and all there were so perfect. many of these French, you know, grand dames, you know, in, mm-hmm. in from this time who were fantastic, wonderful pianists. And um, we don't really hear of them anymore, so this is kind of a good opportunity. Yeah, and, and, and she could play. She certainly can. She apparently practiced scales every single day for an hour. Ew. Yeah. And then that's that was the only the beginning. And then another hour of etudes. Like she would she says she practiced six Chopin etudes every single day. She never wavered from this. And you can hear this certainly in um this Paganini etude, the third Paganini etude, um the famously known as La Campanella. The only Paganini etude that was not based on a, a, a caprice. A caprice. Right. Interesting. And it's the most famous as well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Shall we? We shall. Thank you. 
uh, that was Jean-Marie Daré playing the third etude, uh, the Paganini etude by Liszt, uh, La Campanella. Well, those scales served her well. I the think etudes. they did. I was, I was thinking the same thing, of course, because it's an impeccable performance. Oh and goodness, uh, right? she, like you, when you play, mm -hmm. she has a, great, a certain gift uh, that she uses to good advantage, and that is a, a steadiness of pulse. Hmm, thank you. <laughs> well, um, and yet it's not stiff or cold. No, no, right? no, no. And, and neither, and neither is yours. <laughs> I might <laughs> thank add. You, thank you. But uh, but one one notices that, especially mm -hmm. when uh, one is a, a player. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you notice that in others because you know it's something that has to be worked towards and perfected. You know. And what this is, of course, before editing, and it's absolutely. Perfect, pretty much. Well, what year is this recorded? Huh, uh, that's a good question. I don't think it could be before editing. The I don't think this is edited. It sounds like an LP, mm -hmm. regular hmm. recording, and they could edit LPs. I should, actually, I was hoping you would know the year of oh. this. Oh. Do I have to do everything? Oh, no, oh, no, <laughs> no, some, some things, yeah. Do I have to do something? Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> There's a it's uh, unprecedented. <laughs> there's a pretty funny story about the uh, the little the small bell, you know, uh, the the D sharps and the and the top. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> apparently, when a List was giving a master class, and his student was making a complete mess out of this, and so List, of course, he sat down and he started playing, and it was absolutely perfect. Not a single note was missed, <laughs> and he would. Uh, he would be talking at the same time, and he's saying, you know, this is very easy. See how easy it is. And he's not even looking at his hands, and he keeps hitting the D-sharps. And at one point, he missed one note. And so the whole class just goes silent. And Liz just smiles a little and says, you see, even I could miss a note if I try. <laughs> if I try. <laughs> yeah, if I try. <laughs> I, was, I thought you were going to tell another story about it where mm -hmm. that involved uh, – uh, playing that on a piano, where all the notes were the C and the D and the D and the and the uh, uh, C sharp were also tuned to D sharp. So oh my <laughs> Even goodness. if you missed it, you'd it, get it. Oh god, <laughs> that's, that's cheating. <laughs> you have to take the risk. <laughs> but of course, his 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 lists feats at the uh, piano, not his you know feet, but his his uh, accomplishments at the mm -hmm. piano are. Mind-boggling, literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. think of his sight reading, his score reading, you know, reading composers, messed up, sloppy manuscript, and then playing it in the most perfect way. Absolute his Greek concerto. The Mendelssohn like, G minor uh -huh. he read, and Mendelssohn wrote about it, that he was astounded. Yeah. You couldn't play it more beautifully, yeah. and he wrote in a letter, you know. And it was the first time, he, I mean, it was yeah. a... Well, manuscript. Grieg, Grieg brought the manuscript of his concerto, and he played the orchestra part and the piano part. And he was Grieg was apparently just laughing and he laughing. he w was reduced yeah. to laughter. And yeah. and I uh, like when Liszt, when he was playing that he, at the end, uh, he said, "Wonderful, ya da ya da 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 da." Instead of ya da da da, it was different, yeah. right? Absolutely, he, he noticed it, half it right? Isn't it amazing? He said, "Wonderful, ya da ya da 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 da." Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, and of course he sight read through the. Islamic as well, the Balakirev. That is supposed to be the most difficult piece. And he also did a Greek uh, violin sonata where he uh -huh. w wove the parts, you know, yeah. in between the accompaniment and everything. That's just like he just yeah. people, it's like a freak of nature. Yeah, yeah. To uh, <laughs> uh, just have one recording of him playing, right? Yeah. What we wouldn't give. And he just about almost could have done it, you know. I mean, maybe missed it by right. a year or two or something, you yes, know, because yes. the, I think 1888, Hoffman and Bülow were supposedly recorded mm -hmm, the Edison mm -hmm, cylinders. Mm -hmm. And also he, he could have come to the United, to America, America. He could have and come to uh, our he fair didn't. shores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He could have come right to He visited came, us yeah. in Brooklyn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Played the Brooklyn Academy, probably was in existence then. I mean, Hoffman who was here in 1887. Mm -hmm. That's only one year after Liszt died. Oh, certainly. I mean, during Liszt's lifetime, the, the, People were absolutely crowding and to get into to make the big bucks, right, in, mm -hmm. in America. Right. Yeah. I have yet to f read, although I'm anxious to, uh, the Henri Hertz book about touring uh, in, in America. I've read excerpts. H have you of read it? it? Yeah, I've just read excerpts of it. You, you know? The banjo is in sorte de guitare. Yes. <laughs> that, 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 that. But doesn't that sound like ace? A plus reading, you know. Oh you my know. goodness! I mean, it's it's absolute bedtime reading, <laughs> high entertainment. Mais yeah. mais mais journée en, en Amérique or something like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Anyway, <laughs> let's get. We said we weren't going to have fun. We were going to play music. Okay. <laughs> well, then, shall we hear Eileen Joyce? <laughs> 
Great yes. idea. Yes, yes. Born eighteen. Aussie oh, or Aussie, as Aussie, they say there. Yes. They don't say Aussie. They say Aussie. Aussie. Well, because yeah. Aussie. Tasmanian. Right? Um, she's she Tasmanian. Actually, that's she's right. Tas- yes, but she's Spanish Irish, blood wise, and uh, so she's she studied in Germany and she but she ended concluded her studies with Tobias Mate, who was the one of. I would say, you know, one of the greatest teachers, most influential teachers. And his book on piano technique is still um, extremely important. Um, very Do you think interesting. he had kind of a cult following you know, in a way? And, sure, and, uh, certainly. I mean, England. Absolutely. And, but his books are not really studied, but many, many people, um, such as uh, Taubman, for example, the Taubman technique or the method is largely based on what Tobias Matei wrote. And so um, he really understood something about the, the human body and the natural way, not just to play fast or accurately, but to create a beautiful sound. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you can hear that in, in all of his students, most famous probably being Myra Hess. Um, yes, but quite. Eileen Joyce was, had an enormous stamina. She was extremely famous uh, for about three decades and, and a stage presence and beautiful yeah. very very beautiful which helps and uh so here she is playing schlutzer's uh, who schlutzer do you, yes <laughs> no one knows that right and uh etude and a flat major where we can really hear uh her wonderfully fast nimble fingers to say the least it's yes. uh doesn't sound easy but she makes it sound uh, she's quite fluent yes. let's give her a listen
So that's the uh, Australian Eileen Joyce playing Schlitzer's Etude and A flat. Lisa Yui, oh. thank you so much. What <laughs> thank a great you so show. Much, James. Even if nobody was listening, it would have been a great time. <laughs> <laughs> such a such a pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Thank <laughs> you.